nice introduction. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I'll start my lecture. Good evening to everyone and uh, to all the members of the Philippine Society for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and to all our colleagues and guests from the Philippine Psychiatric Association and other medical societies. Uh, from the Department of Education, of course, I'd like to welcome our uh, guest, uh, special guest reactor, uh, Director Ronil Dako from the Department of Education for sharing her time with us tonight. To all the parents, students, and teachers who are joining us tonight in this webinar, good evening to all of you. So there are two speakers and one reactor tonight, and we are here to talk about an important uh, topic every student, parent, and teacher would want to understand and listen to. And that is what education will be like in the new normal for students, parents, and the school system. So I'm here to talk about education in the new normal, the learning, and the psychosocial challenges to students. It's okay. my slide. Okay, so these are the objectives of my lecture to know and understand the challenges and the learning experiences of students in time of the pandemic, to discuss gu uh, guides, principles, and models of implementation for reopening schools safely during pandemic in the Philippines and other countries, to present the learning modalities implemented during uh, the pandemic and how students are coping, uh, to present the science, uh, what science says about how safe it is to reopen schools during a pandemic, to look back in history and present lessons and strategies in reopening schools during a pandemic, and to discuss the challenges in the mental health of students in adjusting to the new normal in education. So first, let's define new normal. So aside from COVID, uh, which we can call as the word of the year, we always hear and say the term new normal. So what is new normal? With the coronavirus pandemic, we uh, have now a new catch word, and that is the new normal. Now the Oxford Dictionary defines catch word as briefly popular or fashionable word or phrase used to encapsulate a particular concept. So what is the concept embracing the new normal? So the American Dictionary defines new normal as a previously unfamiliar or a typical situation that has become standard, usual, or expected. So what has become now the new normal? What compose this new normal? So these are the different variations of lockdowns, quarantines, wearing of face masks and face shields, frequent washing of hands, taking vitamins and nutrients to nurture health, the respiratory etiquette, the social and physical distancing, and the support of technology. So which now brings us to the discussion on learning in the new normal. So uh, blended learning is not wholly new. Uh, Philippine universities such as the UP Open University have used blended learning. And in the new normal, all schools will have blended or purely online courses. So during these worrying and abnormal times, it's natural to have a lot of questions. And some helpful ones you may want to ask are, what steps has the school taken to ensure the safety of students? So how will the school support the learning of students? And how will the school support the mental health of students? And how will the school refer children who may need referrals for specialized support? Now let us focus first on the current events. So President Duterte decided to keep the national capital region and several provinces under GCQ, uh, while other areas revert to stricter quarantine measures for the entire month of September. So how long this pandemic will last, we're not sure. But to date, the Philippines has recorded around uh, more than 220,000 cases of COVID-19 and more than 3,500 uh, have, have died, while 100, more than 157,000 have recovered. 
Now, the Philippines is under a state of public health emergency and state of calamity due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Department of Education Secretary, uh, Yonor Bri uh, Briones, made recommendations to defer class opening because learners in the national capital region, and that is Metro Manila and Calabarzon, are affected by the reimposition of stringent quarantine restrictions. And President Duterte has agreed to postpone the opening of basic uh, education classes for school year 2020-2021 to October 5 of this year. Now, the Calabarzon alone has more than 4 million learners, while NCR has more than 2 million learners. And they comprise more than a fourth of 23 million K-12 enrollees in both uh, public and private schools for the incoming school year. Now, the directive to postpone uh, class opening covers both public and public and private schools. However, private schools that have already resumed classes may continue such as universities and colleges that offer basic education. And according to Secretary Briones, a good example of this is Sikihor uh, that started school in June and they are doing well with the support of the local government. And Sikihor was allowed to resume school uh, since June of this year. Sikihor used to have um, zero COVID-19 case. And as of uh, August uh, 13, the Department of Health Central Visayas regional office reported uh, only three cases on the island. Now, classes were rescheduled to open on uh, August 24, but without face-to-face -face instruction to avert transmission of the coronavirus disease among the learners and teachers. And in view of the face-to-face -face sessions, the Department of Education is preparing to implement three types of distance learning, and that is modular distance learning, online distance learning or the TV and radio based instruction and calls to postpone classes have been made to have more time for preparations for these distance learning schemes. And Secretary Brion has also said that the defer deferment of class opening is also pursuant to Republic Act 11480, which gives the president the power to decide on the class opening during a calamity. Okay, now the Department of Education reiterated to the government the following requisites for safe and quality education. One is to effectively control the spread of the pandemic and address the economic crisis. Second is to ensure the safety of schools by filling in the shortages on facilities, personnel and equipment, and installing comprehensive health protection mechanisms. And to provide all the needs of the distance learning modalities. So under, under distance uh, learning, the learners and the teachers must have smartphones or laptop, desktop, ta and tablet computers. And in the absence of such gadgets, the learning sessions will be conducted through television or radio. Now the Philippine government's decision again to postpone uh, the opening of public schools from August 24 to October 5 reflects the difficulties in it, um, that it is encountering in addressing the, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, when COVID-19 lockdowns were imposed in March across the country, classes in most schools were already ending. And so the disruption caused by the pandemic to the learning of most students was minimal. But as the public health crisis intensified, the traditional June opening of classes was moved to August. And this was seen by almost all stakeholders as necessary to ensure the safety of students, teachers, and other school personnel. But they also expected that the government um, would use the postponement to strategize and implement programs that would make it possible to resume classes without triggering further COVID 19 outbreaks. So meanwhile, many colleges and universities, which are mostly privately owned, have started classes despite the fear that many students from poor families will be left behind. And students whose parents lost jobs and livelihoods during the pandemic might be forced to drop out. And some groups argued also that it might be better to adopt 
an academic freeze instead of allowing schools to operate while the pandemic is still raging. But this controversial proposal was also rejected since it might do more harm to young people whose right to education will be denied to them. So what health and safety steps have countries taken when reopening schools? So the next that we want to know are what health and safety steps have countries taken when reopening the schools? And for these slides, we have the Council on Foreign Relations as the source of this information. So how schools can reopen safely during the pandemic? And what are the challenges to reopening schools? So by late March of 2020, the coronavirus pandemic unfolded. Schools closed in nearly every country and affecting more than 1.5 billion learners, according to UNESCO. And in many places, educators quickly shifted to remote teaching, teaching with the hope of salvaging the academic year. And educators worldwide are facing the agonizing uh, decision of whether to resume in-person instruction while there's still no cure for the new coronavirus. But the lack of access to technology and concerns about widening achievement gaps have forced a seemingly impossible decision uh, on two school leaders, and that is to reopen their doors and risk new outbreaks of the virus versus to continue virtual alternatives that could leave students further behind and suffering from social isolation. So uh, countries, countries including D Denmark, India, and Kenya are taking different approaches. And uh, according to Jennifer Nuzo, an epidemiologist from John Hopkins University, it is safely possible to reopen schools but one of the first criteria that needs to be met is that we not have an epidemic that's spiraling out of control. And the worst scenario, the worst case scenario for many school administrators and public health officials is if schools suffer an outbreak after reopening that sickens dozens of students or teachers and spreads to the community and causes deaths. Okay, uh, Kenya's education ministry, uh, let's have Kenya as an example, um, announced in July that schools will remain closed through the end of 2020, with students expected to repeat the school year. And while the government said it is working to make online learning more accessible to Kenyan students and has been broadcasting some school programs on the radio and television, it acknowledged that many households do not have the technological resources to fully switch to remote learning. So that is uh, a photo of how it, what schools like uh, during pandemic in Kenya. Okay, now when Israel reopened schools in May, the government did not require schools to follow social distancing guidelines for long and many classrooms returned to full size with around 40 students. And since then, more than 2,000 people have tested positive throughout the country's education system, and at least one teacher has died. The parents and guardians have refused to send their children to school out of concern for both their child's safety and their own. And now Israel is uh, requiring schools with reported COVID cases to close for two weeks and all students and staff to uh, have to go on quarantine. Now, Germany, um, where infection rates are low, um, they have taken a different approach uh, by keeping classes running and forcing only close contacts of the infected person to quarantine. And reopening schools is also expensive because health experts have called on schools to guarantee that they have enough personal protective equipment such as masks and face shields for students and teachers, cleaning supplies and other safety materials, including plastic barriers, uh, and the costs of which can add up. 
Okay, so that is how it looks like in Germany. Now in India, many states have relied on a government developed e-learning portal since the summer break ended in June and a massive challenge in a country where uh, just 11% of households had a computer and 24% had internet in 2018, though at least one of these port portals can be used offline. Now at schools across South Korea, children eat their lunches in silence, facing plastic screens that separate them from friends. They wear masks except when practicing social distancing in the playground. And their temperatures are checked twi twice every morning, first at home and again at the school gates. And this could be the new re reality for the millions of children around the world. And so that's how it looks like in Korea. And in Thailand, another Asian country. Okay, so in the United States and the United Kingdom and some European countries that closed schools during the coronavirus pandemic, the governments are debating when and how to open schools. So a growing number of studies show that there are ways to do this safely. And the key is vigilance on hygiene and physical distancing and a swift uh, public health response to halt the spread of any infection and most crucially, low levels of viral spread in the community. Now let me present, so that's in the United Kingdom. Okay, so let me present to you briefly the executive summary of models of school reopening globally. So there is a lack of scientific consensus about the impact of school closures and reopenings on community transmission of COVID-19. And there is considerable concern about the indirect effect of school closures on students and parents. Another is that most models of school reopening involve reductions of class size, increasing physical distance between students and keeping students in defined groups with limited interaction between groups to reduce the potential for wide scale transmission within the school. And um, another is that most countries that have reopened schools have instituted some degree of staggering the start, the stop and break times within the school. And a number of countries are using alternate shifts like morning and afternoon or alternate days while a smaller number of countries have maintained uh, relatively normal school schedules. And more countries have reopened only for younger students than have reopened only for older students to accommodate the increase in resources. Now, in a number of countries, face masks are required for students and staff in schools with variability of the lower age limit for face mask um, requirements. However, some countries are not using face masks as a part of their reopening model. And systematic school-based testing for COVID uh, virus or antibodies um, is being done on a small scale uh, in a limited number of settings, but this approach is not widely implemented at this time. So I'm presenting to you, although the letters are very small, uh, this is a table of how countries are using different models in uh, reopening schools. Drink. Now, online education has grown in popularity and accessibility and attracting students with its uh, schedule friendly format options. And these formats can be grouped broadly into two categories, and that is synchronous and asynchronous. So what's the difference between synchronous learning and asynchronous learning? And uh, the answer could have a huge impact on a student's online education experience. So what is synchronous learning? So synchronous learning is online or distance education that happens in real time often with a set uh, class schedule and required login times. And uh, synchronous learning happens in real time. And this means that you 
your classmates and your instructor interact in a specific virtual place at a set time. And in these uh, courses, instructors commonly take attendance, same as they would do in a lecture hall. And the common methods of uh, synchronous online learning include video conferencing, teleconferencing, live chatting, and live streamed lectures that must be viewed in real time. So what are the advantages of synchronous learning? One is uh, classroom engagement. Um, there's also dynamic learning and instructional depth. So if you like active discussion, immediate feedback and personal interactions with peers and instructors, you will probably prefer a synchronous learning experience. Now, in terms of uh, dynamic learning and instru instructional depth, with synchronous online learning, you interact regularly and frequently with your professors and you get to know them. And this provides regular opportunities for face-to-face -face discussion individual guidance and mentorship without having to schedule independent appointments. But what are the disadvantages of synchronous learning? So uh, there's rigid schedule and te technical difficulties. So if your work or life requires um, extensive travel and you often find yourself completing core, uh, coursework in uh, other places like coffee shops, airport, and uh, hotels, then synchronous learning might add uh, to your stress. The constant search for a wireless signal becomes even more dire when you're on the clock for a video conference, lecture, or even an exam. Okay, so what is now the asynchronous learning? So asynchronous learning happens on your schedule. While your course of study uh, instructor or program will provide materials for reading, lectures for viewing and assignments for completing, uh, and exams for evaluation, you can access and save and satisfy these requirements on your own schedule, schedule so long as you meet the expected de deadlines. And asynchronous learning does not require real-time interaction. Instead, the Content is available online for students to access when it is best when it best suits their schedules, and uh, assignments are completed to deadlines. So, what are the ad advantages of asynchronous learning? Its flexibility, pacing, and affordability. Okay, and um, what are the disadvantages of asynchronous learning? It's isolation and risk of apathy. So if you like the personal touch and do your best when you feel like people are actually listening, asynchronous learning can be a lonely experience for you. But opportunities to, and opportunities to discuss and debate, uh, debate and network with classmates and professors are, are scarce. And asynchronous learning is great when you want to pick up skills quickly, but if you're looking for enrichment of uh, discussion and feedback and social interaction, then asynchronous learning is not likely for you. Okay, so let me move forward. Okay, so let me define uh, other terms uh, that is uh, about virtual uh, education or virtual learning. So what is online learning? In online learning, the key element is the use of internet. And online learning refers to the idea of using online tools for learning. Basically, an online course implies a distance between you and uh, your teachers. The lectures, assignments, and tests are all enabled by virtual platforms. And you will not have to travel at all for your studies. What is blended learning? So blended learning is a combination of uh, learning uh, at a distance and the traditional on-campus learning in a classroom. And basically you will have a fixed schedule where you will have to attend uh, part of the classes on campus. Okay, and, and what is distance learning? 
Um, distance learning is understood and is often used as a synonym with online learning. And why the different wording? It is because it was initially introduced to attract students from all over the world. And this is how it became possible for students from Europe, for instance, to easily attend an American college and uh, become an international student without needing to travel. So choosing the learning style that you really that really suits you. So the success of your online studies depends a lot on the teaching environment. That's why the teaching methods developed or used by universities play a key role in your development. Both online or blended learning programs are designed to make better use of the real potential of digital technology and enhance your learning experience through innovative approaches. Okay, so let me move forward. So um, virtually, students are currently missing face-to-face -face instruction due to COVID-19. And many parents and educators share a common worry. When the pandemic subsides, then kids will return to school with lower achievement. And there are also concerns that the gap between high and low achieving students will become larger. And so ultimately, we wanted to know what sort of learning losses could we expect from the shortened 2019-2020 school year. Now, current school closures have added uh, to the time that most students already spend at home during the summer months without explicit face-to-face -face instruction from teachers. And meanwhile, teachers are, scram are scrambling to adapt content for an online platform, and parents are juggling work responsibilities, if not joblessness, with caring for and educating their own children. And students themselves are faced with isolation, anxiety about a deadly virus, and uncertainty about the future. So in so many ways, the current situation is unprecedented for most people alive today. And this table shows households and internet access in selected countries. So this is a 2016 data from the World Economic Forum Council on Foreign Relations. And in the Philippines, you will see that many of the countries, uh, 27 million school-aged children do not have computers or internet at home. Now, the question is, will digital learning continue or disrupt the tradition? How will ECQ learning uh, through contactless digital technologies shape our society? So in a world changed by coronavirus um, disease, the educational system must adapt to ensure that learning continues. And digital learning has been the, the common resort of students, teachers, and parents in many settings undergoing some form of lockdown prohibiting large assemblies and gatherings and constraining physical distancing. Okay, but there are opportunities um, opened by the new normal. And that is, and those are the interest and aptitude of youngsters navigating the digital portal, the availability and diversity of free e-resources for learning, the possibilities of real-time engagement among mentors and learners, and the flexibility of the multimodal learning system to continue learning despite disruptions has been cited as some of the opportunities opened by the new normal approach adjusting to the pandemic and the ECQ. Okay, now um, history related to education in the past pandemic. There are three lessons from how schools responded to the 1918 uh, pandemic worth heeding today. So according to Mary uh, Battenfeld, who is a clinical professor of American and New England studies at the Boston University, as a professor and as a professor who teaches and writes about children's history, she said that she has studied um, how schools reopened to the 1919 influenza pandemic. And much like what has happened in 2020, most U.S. schools closed during the 1918 influenza pandemic and their doors were shut uh, for up to four months. 
and she sees three main lessons today's educators and policy makers can draw from how schools and the communities responded to the last century's pandemic. Okay, so this is uh, the pandemic in, in 1918. So one is uh, invest in school nurses. The school nurses were transformative when they were first introduced in 1902. And uh, rather than simply send six students home, uh, where they would uh, miss school, which while receiving no treatment, nurses cared for children's illnesses and provided health information to their families. And after a study showed that nurses cut student absences in half, more and more city, cities funded them. Okay, so this is uh, a photo of uh, in 1918. Another lesson is partner with other authorities. So in a version of the African proverb that it takes a village to raise a child, a study of schools in, um, in 43 cities during the 1918 pandemic identified planning that brings public health, education, officials, and political leaders together as key to successful responses. And such cooperation also helps schools as they reopen. And the third lesson is to tie uh, education sorry tie education to other priorities so in 1916 the u.s bureau of education proclaimed that the education of the schools is important but life and health are more important so reformers of the period known as the progressive era uh, took that notion to heart and in addition to school nurses, they established school lunch programs, they built playgrounds, and they also promoted outdoor uh, education. Okay, let me move forward. So here's what uh, science say about, says about um, uh, how safe it really is to reopen. So um, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, returning to school is important for the healthy development and well-being of children. And uh, we must pursue reopening in a way that is safe for all students, teachers, and staff. And science should drive decision-making on safely reopening schools. So, um, so to reopen schools, but only it is safe. And that is the, the verdict from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Now, from the, according to the World Health Organization, reopen schools only in places with low infection rates and low community transmission. So the WHO also says that the decision for children teachers and staff with underlying conditions like asthma, obesity, or diabetes to return to school depends on their health condition, the current uh, transmission of COVID-19 within their community, and also the protective measures the school and the community have in place to reduce the risk of the COVID-19 transmission. So what are the risks uh, of keeping children at home? So education experts warn of severe consequences for students missing out on critical in-person instruction. So researchers, uh, researchers project significant learning losses across countries that have closed uh, schools with even worse consequences expected for children in countries with already low learning outcomes and less resilience to shocks. And in a June statement, the American Acad Academy of Pediatrics urged school leadership to strive to have the U.S. students physically present in school in the coming academic year. Now, noting that school spaces are fundamental not only for academic instruction, but also for children's nutrition, social and emotional skills, and mental and physical health. But some critics of this long-term distance um, learning also argue that as parents and guardians uh, return to work, they will not be able to stay at home with their children. 
So what are the effects on the social and the emotional health of children? So we have been talking about the importance of social emotional learning and educators across the world have been trying to bring in this aspect of learning in their daily routine by organizing their lesson plans and making considerable space for social and emotional learning in their practice. So, um, so humans are social beings and it is imperative for them to possess social and emotional skills prior to acquiring other skills. Social and emotional skills must go hand in hand. Emotional skills talk about identifying, expressing, and managing their emotions. While social skills are about making connections and relating to others and being able to negotiate and build relationships with peers, adults, and colleagues. Now, the isolated lifestyle in the pandemic has changed the definition of socialization and has led children and adults to experience a variety of feelings. And a lesson learned is that we need to have school-wide strategic planning of systematically addressing these issues. And children need to be taught how to recognize, manage, and balance their emotional upheaval. And the parent and teacher community need to work collaboratively and compassionately with each other during this challenging time for the betterment of themselves and for their children. Now, um, during this challenging time, the transition did not did take a toll on teachers and the state of well-being. And it is essential for schools and leadership to make social and emotional learning a separate subject to be taught to children and a separate rigorous training to be imparted to teachers. Now, let me move to... Uh, okay, let me move forward. Um, so the student mental health in the midst of uh, COVID-19. So while the global uh, development of the coronavirus disease uh, pandemic, the psychological issues which accompany this pandemic have rapidly compounded its public health uh, burden. And um, research that investigates beyond the population level is required to understand the individualized disruption of lives and routines as a result of COVID-19 and its associated psychological impacts. And as of this time, there is a wide call for further research and immediate solutions. And to date, uh, one published st study has explored the impact of COVID-19 on student education and well-being. And that is a study done by Kao et al. in 2020. Okay, so pre preliminary studies or findings highlight the many factors contributing to students' distress during this pandemic. And there is a timely call to uh, action for further research examining the impact of COVID-19 on student mental health is suggested. Now, I'm on my last few slides. So we also deal with privacy issues in virtual and online education. And the uh, privacy professionals are watching concerns uh, compound during the COVID-19 outbreak as the effects of the virus bring new problems in privacy issues. And privacy issue is one area in which this collision of problems have uh, revealed itself the most. And um, with their adoption of technologies, many schools and teachers have shown preference for ease of use rather than considering a product or platform that will best preserve the student privacy and privacy problems that come with online learning technology are the collection and potential use of students personal information as well as employing products or platforms that are not designed for children and so concerns may indeed stem from the mad rush to get online forcing schools to shift classrooms online within an expedited time to keep uh, schedules and students on track. And such a quick turnaround has pushed schools that are unfamiliar with online learning to choose less privacy-friendly technologies and platform. So, okay. So maybe, um, so students or children may use these products, but uh, 
but then their data is being sucked into the general stream of data and data uses that happen with commercial and for-profit platforms. And that is according to Zaid of the American Privacy Data Law. Okay, so with that, I'd like to um, end my uh, lecture with this quotation from Charles Einstein that um, we sense that normal may not be coming back, but we are born into a new normal, a new kind of society, and a new relationship to the earth and a new experience of being human. So these are my references. And thank you, everyone, for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Concepcion.